Welcome everyone. My name is Christina McClellan and I am the education manager for AVA. AVA is, is short for Abrams Engel Institute for the Visual Arts and we are the Visual Arts Center located on the campus of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We present eight to ten exhibitions a year highlighting a mix of regionally, nationally, and internationally acclaimed artists focusing almost exclusively on contemporary art. We serve a diverse audience of uh, university faculty and staff, uh, students, but also um, artists, museum patrons, and donors. We help represent the visual arts at UAB to local and regional institutions, but also to the national and international art community, while simultaneously striving to keep our exhibitions directly relevant and engaging to our surrounding Birmingham communities. Since opening in 2014, Ava has been featured in publications such as the New York Times, the Huffington Post, The Nation, Raw Vision Magazine, and PBS Canvas. And we are very proud that our exhibitions and related educational programming, such as tonight, are free and open to the public. So uh, tonight is coloring night. Uh, this is an idea that was born of the Student Arts Council. So welcome to all of our students and to our Student Arts Council members who are here tonight. Um, and before we get started, I'm going to do a quick few housekeeping notes. Note that discriminatory or hate language of any kind will not be tolerated. The session is being recorded, but the recordings are largely the screen shares and the spotlighted videos. So we want to encourage you, if you feel comfortable with it, to turn on your screens. Tonight's a night to decompress, color, and participate in the discussion about art. So we want you guys to ask questions. Um, at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat feature. Please direct your questions to the group, or if you want to direct it only to one person, please direct it to Trevor McMullen. He's going to wave his hands here. Uh, and Trevor will be asking the questions as conversation allows. So please, as a question uh, pops into your mind, go ahead and type it into the chat. Um, but before uh, tonight's event, uh, I want to draw your attention to some of our other upcoming events. Uh, tonight's Outside the Lines is part of a semester long featuring professors and students from the Department of Art and Art History. So join us again next month, April 1st, to where we feature our graduating seniors of the Department of Art and Art History of the Bachelor of Fine Arts Art Studio program. They're going to be sharing a little bit about their work, a preview uh, before their final exhibition at AVA. Also, um, check out AVA's webpage. Even though we cannot currently open to the public in a large capacity, we have we are still rotating our exhibitions and they are up online in a virtual reality experience. So be sure to check out all of those and, um, and keep checking back as we will have more exhibitions available to you throughout uh, the spring as well as the summer semesters. With these exhibitions, uh, we have more upcoming events, including Inside the Arts events. Uh, chamber music will be on March 18th. And then on March 30th, we will have a spoken word event, uh, which is poetry being uh, created about the exhibitions by UAB students. So check that out. Uh, and then the Student Arts Council, which again is the kind of their brainchild is this event. Uh, they will be holding their visual, uh, sorry, their virtual concert on March 19th, and then a, uh, a soon to be announced visual arts activity night um, in April. So um, keep checking back for that. Uh, we're really excited for everything the Student Arts Council is doing. So um, without, uh, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, art play. <laughs> I forgot about that one. Um, art play classes have started, but if you uh, would like and have time, uh, you can sign up for those and uh, keep checking back for workshops as well as lunch and learns for them. We have a lunch and learn coming up next week on the uh, art of flower arrangement. So without further ado, um, we're going to quickly show what we're working on tonight. So if you want to turn on your cameras and whatever art project you're going to be working on, um, if you are working on one, we would love to see what uh, the beginning part. Uh, I tried to get a head start because I know I'm not gonna be able to work much on it <laughs> tonight, um, but yeah, excellent. So we'll check back in at the end of the, yeah, awesome, Danielle. Hi, Danielle. <laughs> um, we'll check back in with you guys at the end of the event. So now on to our featured artist for this evening, Derek Krakow. 
Hey. Hey. <laughs> Derek Krakow is the Associate Professor of Printmaking here at UAB. He first earned his BFA from Louisiana State University before earning a MFA from Syracuse University. As a printmaker, Krakow in uh, innovates to combine the traditional printmaking process with computer graphics and beyond. His work is an exploration of viewing ranging from relationships to personal perspective. Krakow has exhibited nationally and internationally, including participating in exhibitions at the Center for Contemporary Art in Rotterdam, Netherlands, Brooklyn Museum of Art in New York, Long Beach Island Foundation for the Arts, Spirit Art Center in New York, as well as here at AVA, Huntsville Museum of Art, and many more. Uh, his work has been purchased by several museums and is also held in the private collections throughout the world. And we are so excited to have you here. Welcome, Derek. Um, I'm so glad you were able to do this with us tonight. I'm glad you guys invited me. Thank you, you know, for the yeah. opportunity to share, you know, so um, I'm not, uh, I'm new to this format. So um, you got to excuse me. I've never given a, a, a artist talk over Zoom. So what I'm going to do, I guess, uh, should I start my, my slide lecture now? Should I go yeah. ahead and share my screen? Absolutely. And why don't you start off telling us um, kind of how did you get into art? And what influenced you? Uh, how did I get into art? Ooh, that's a... Um, I actually, I remember getting punished one night when I was in t a teenager and I couldn't go out to a show that all my friends were going to. So I sat at home and I started drawing on my notebooks um, while I was in my room. And then when I went to school, I started getting positive affirmations from fellow students with the drawings on the covers of my notebooks. And they kept asking me to draw on their notebooks. So it just started you know, flowing from there, you know, that's when I realized I had some sort of talent for this. And um, I started working towards art, you know, early on, I was a junior in high school when I made the decision to become an artist. So, um, and it was really peer pressure, you know, just not a peer pressure, but peer, um, how would you say it, like affirmation, you know, that that got me, um, got me there, you know, so you know, let me uh, go ahead and switch this over, share screen. It's also really important to have that as you get into the arts, because there's also usually a lot of pushback sometimes from family or friends who, uh, you know, might have thought they had in mind a different trajectory. Oh, no, oh, totally. My father's a physician. So he was like, well, how are you going to make a living being an artist? And it wasn't until I got into um, undergrad and I started winning awards and getting grants. Um, and fellowships that he was like, okay, maybe he's okay. Maybe he's got talent, you know, he, but he couldn't say it for himself. He couldn't see it for himself. It had to be validated from outside, you know? So, um, but yeah, he's a, he's scientific minded and he was nervous. So I'm showing you guys about, uh, this is going back to around 2003 and forward, just little snippets because my work is, is, um, visually distinct in terms of the series they they i i um design my images based on the concept so the the uh, uh, aesthetic changes depending on what it is i'm trying to talk about i want to make sure that the concept drives the imagery so um i begin any work by first choosing a concept right and then um that concept frames the body of work that it's built on. It guides um, uh, the imagery, creating a cohesive series. Once I have an understanding of what I want to begin, the process of collecting images, especially when my collage work is probably the most import important part. The collection of images. Um, uh, I got to open this up and I have to move some stuff. Excuse me. I can't read my notes here because the, uh, the videos are over the top of it. All right. Um, it's important that images don't speak directly to the concept that I'm trying to um, create. They must allude to, but not illustrate the main point. I'm looking for images that are ambiguous in nature and that draw the viewer in to make several conclusions. I don't, um, art doesn't answer questions. It asks them. All right. Why is that working? There we go. All right, so this is the next one. This is Lambs to Slaughter. This was around 2003. Um, Heartlands is a reaction to several things that happened in, at one time. The first is the uh, 
commotion about sexual deviance within the Catholic Church. And the other is a demonstration I witnessed in New Orleans at a festival called Southern Decadence, an annual gay pride festival. While there, I witnessed a series of protests by an angry group of Christians uh, just behind St. Louis Cathedral during the openly angry demonstration uh, against gay culture, two uh, lesbians began hugging in front of the protesters. This scene made me think, why are the protesters so angry? What is it about their mythology and their religion that caused them to have such aggression? Right? I feel that there is a flaw all right, in Catholic iconography. Right? If Jesus is supposed to be uh, a symbol for all men and Mary a symbol for all women, there are incomplete icons, neither fully express what it is to be human. Both icons within Catholic iconography ignore human sexuality. And out of the two, Mary is the most. All right? um, the images that I keep recur reoccurring in my work are uh, works of the gun, all right, white hearts, lambs, all right, the gun acts as a symbol for the Catholic Church use of sexual sex as a weapon against its parishioners, the hearts represent the neutrality of the word love in our culture, and the lambs act as a traditional symbol for us as the parishioners. I think the lamb is a really good symbol for us, and I think Jesus as a shepherd is a perfect symbol for the Catholicism. Um, uh, uh, a shepherd is not altruistic. Um, they don't raise lambs so that they can grow old in a field and die of natural causes. They're meant to be sheared and slaughtered. And just like us, we are just um, lambs for them to use as they, as they wish. So Derek, why Catholicism? Why I'm Catholic. You know, um, uh, uh, grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic boarding school. You know, um, uh, they taught me it was a great education, um, but it was uh, enough of an education for me to question everything that they taught me in religion. You know, that I just I, there was I just couldn't get it. Just couldn't. You know, I, I'm I'm faithless is the best way for, for me for me to to put that. I'm not I'm not one of of a religion at all. So this this piece um, cocked and loaded an empty threat. These two hang together simultaneously. You know, in in, in the exhibition, they're pointed. The gun is pointed at Jesus as if he's blindfolded. All right. The image uh, that keeps reoccurring in my work of the gun, um, white heart. Oh wait, this one it didn't uh, switch my notes. Oh well. And the hearts represent, okay, I already said all this, but the, the two are represented, it's almost like he's in a firing squad, okay, so he's, it's hung up and it's set up that way so that, so that it looks like the gun is firing towards him, towards Jesus, all right, let's go. We'll move on. All right, and so this one here is weapon of choice. Um, the process in here, guys, it's um, collage, vinyl, on panel. So the way I work these, I um, collect everything from um, uh, uh, prayer cards to prostitute calling cards from Las Vegas. And in this one here, you can see the uh, left the left gun are the prostitute calling cards. And on the right is the prayer cards. The two of them, I'm, I really enjoy um, printed ephemera like that stuff that's just kind of thrown away. It has a, a reference to culture and ideas that I think is really um, interesting. Um, and I think that the prayer cards and those prostitute calling cards are about equal in what they're, um, what they, how they act in, in society and in culture. They, they both um, uh, kind of interact with or, or use uh, uh, faith and passion as a way to, uh, to, to, to keep people engaged. Hot mamas. So Derek, I have another question. Yeah. Um, earlier you, you talked about how you got into it was drawing. What made you then switch from drawing to, well, since we're talking about collages at the moment, um, collages in particular. Uh, okay. Um, I enjoy, I, I, I like working with uh, processes that are, um, all right, all right, hold on a second. Let me get, let me get my head straight. Uh, I, I like working with processes that create, um, 
that, that go right to the point. Um, so collage is a quick way for me to work through ideas. I want to, I, I, uh, my process is usually focused on what it is I'm trying to say. So however I can say it in the most efficient and accurate way is what I try and choose. So that's why I'll switch from collage to painting um, to digital, you know, it just whichever way is the most efficient and how, how it uh, begins to blend. So, Sweethearts. Again, all of these are resin, vinyl, and um, and in this sense, uh, 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 transfers, uh, hide glue transfers. Um, a hide glue transfer is taking hide glue, which is a, a medium that's used for a ground for painting. Um, I mix it up like a gelatin. I paint it over the surface of the canvas as it um, congeals and hardens. Then at that point, I can take inkjet transfers that have a, a water soluble emulsion on the surface of it. So that it holds the inkjet in the inkjet inks in this water soluble emulsion. Then when I lay it on the about to be cured gelatin from the high glue, um, the, the moisture in that high glue sucks the ink into it. And it's sort of like a digital fresco. It, uh, it's a way of quickly transferring digital images and getting them onto different substrates that I wouldn't normally be able to, to get them onto uh, through regular printing processes. So all, all of this series, the next, these few series that you see here are all types of high glue transfer. I really enjoy also, if you look, um, the way... Um, uh, the, it, it's, it's not a perfect transfer, unlike a digital print, which is um, crisp and clean and perfect. There are flaws within it that I think are really interesting. You can kind of see them in this piece here. All right. So this one's the Madonna whore. Right? Does anyone know who Marilyn Chambers is? All right. Marilyn Chambers was the mother in the ivory snow box right here. All right. But she was also the main star of a porn in the 1970s called uh, Behind the Green Door. And when this Behind the Green Door hit it big in Hollywood, and it did, it actually made it in the top 10 movies of its time, or for uh, when it was aired, it made it in the top 10. Um, they were so offended that she had done this movie that they pulled her off of the ivory snow boxes. So in a sense, she is the perfect idea of the Madonna whore. She, she was good enough to be a mother, but she wasn't good enough to have sex on camera. So, um, and so the line you see here is this idea of love blurring the line between the Madonna and the whore. And that's what the, the white hearts are doing there. Okay, this one here is mother. All right, this is a collaged, uh, it's a collaged prostitute calling cards from Vegas and vinyl. Um, the funny thing about this is I was taking a road trip out through um, through uh, Vegas and, and the West out there. And while we were in Vegas, we were staying at a hotel in the Strip. Across from the hotel we were at, there was a construction site with this uh, uh, fence going across it, this chain link fence. And these guys that were obviously promoting these uh, lap dances, private lap dances, were coming out and putting these cards in patterns on the fence of the construction site, much like you see in this piece right here. Um, and I, every morning I'd go out and there'd be another pattern on there and I would run out and I'd collect all these cards, bring them back to my hotel room. The next morning there'd be another, you know, pile of cards stuck in this fence. So I'd go out and collect them. I know for sure that these, uh, that the, the, uh, People who ran the uh, hotel thought I was some weird pervert, just running, <laughs> running around collecting these cards for no reason. You know, so there's the detail. You know, you can see it. So the funny thing is that this piece and all this work here was uh, I was invited to show at the University of Dayton. Does anybody know who what the University of Dayton is? Right, it's the second largest Catholic school. Right in the school in 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 the U.S. Right, second to Notre Dame. Um, I didn't know that. Right, so I was invited to exhibit, and then like when you get an invitation, it's usually eighteen to you know twenty four months down the road. So I had a this body of work in, in in the in process. So I packed it up when it was time. I shipped it off to them, and then I get a phone call when when they received it. They were, they they <laughs> weren't sure if they were going to be able to show the exhibit. 
but they did. They actually, you know, they they buckled up and they they actually showed it. They postponed the opening. They forced me to go down and give an artist talk. Um, the artist talk happened to be in a, a room. It was standing room only. Every seat was filled with a priest. There were there was no the students had to sit in the aisles and there were priests all in the in the audience. It was a really like ooh, a little a little tough crowd to have to give a artist lecture to. But I did it, you know, I got it, I got it done. All right, so we're starting to move into this, uh, in, into my, uh, a different series. It's, I'm moving away from um, Heartlands and I'm starting to start working on this idea of this process or, or the um, series called Love. All right, and this is still Heartlands here. I did a bunch of small um, eight and a half by eight and a half panels um, that I collage, uh, I, that I view as a larger installation. They're individual works, but they're installed as a much larger installation like this. Um, and so and Derek, a, can, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, can I ask as well as, as you're kind of going, because uh, the, the ones you were showing earlier were, were bigger pieces of work and then these are smaller. So, um, yeah. How long does it take for you to make these artworks? And then also, you said you already had this body of work in the pipeline before right. going to uh, Dayton. And right. so are you, I take it you're not driven by necessarily the exhibitions, but uh, by an idea. Yes, the ideas and, and uh, you know, whatever the, as I get going in a series, it, one work will breed an idea for another work. And I do, I keep working with those ideas until finally the well runs dry. At some point, I, I feel like I've, I've painted myself into a corner and I, I, I don't have anywhere to go. So that's time maybe to let this, let that one lie, you know, and move on. Um, now, over time, I, I, I've, other ideas have come up and I've worked, come back to these series and done newer ones, you know, so it's not like these are dead. They're just waiting for new ideas that are appropriate for the aesthetic and the concept. So, all right, so here we go. Now we're getting into the word uh, love. All right, so I always found the word love really interesting because look at it, for four letters, look at that definition. I mean, it's a little bit hectic, right? You know, I mean, it's everything. I love my mother. I love my dog. I love hamburgers. I mean, so what is love? On some level, without context, love has no meaning. So that at least the word love has no meaning because it's, it's such a, it has different um, areas. But one of the things that I found really interesting was this, the fatherly concern of God for humankind, all right? And, I thought that that was a little odd to have that as a definition. Why would God, the God be in the dictionary, especially when it comes down to the word love? So 2005 happens. My family lives in Louisiana. This is my father's neighborhood after Hurricane Katrina. Okay. His house is somewhere over here in one of these groups of houses, right? One out of every three houses was completely demolished in his neighborhood. And so these are just photographs for me walking around after the storm, right? And at that same time, because at that time I was driving back and forth from uh, Alabama to New Orleans to help my family dig out from the storm. And um, one of the things I noticed, or one of the things I heard was uh, Christian talk radio saying that um, Katrina was sent to New Orleans for its Sodom and Gomorrah sins. So I got me to thinking, well, does, I thought God loved us. You saw it in the definition, right? That's that word love means God's love. So why was God sending, you know, a, a Katrina to us? All right. Um, so I made this piece right here. It's from God with love, right? Inkjet print. So this is a digital print. So it's like, again, fastest way to get to the idea. I created a little heart in Illustrator. I imported it into Photoshop. And then from there, I used it, created a brush. And then I could, you know, increase or decrease the size of the heart and just click it around and create a pointillist like drawing of the hurricane itself, you know. So that's where this series starts off at, love. It really is an interrogation of that definition that I showed right in the beginning. So this is love for sale. So it's both the prayer cards and the prostitute calling cards because the, you know, the prayer cards are just that. You're purchasing them and you're holding them as a, a relic in, in hopes that your prayers will go up to these saints 
and, and that you're, you're, they, they will love you as much as you love them. All right. Fatal attraction, the idea of, you know, that anyone who is uh, uh, LGBT, uh, LBGTQ um, and in a, a religious institution, it's probably uh, it's a fatal attraction. They're 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 not necessarily uh, wanted in that institution. Okay, uh, porn and propaganda. This was an interesting one. You know those little pamphlets you find at like uh, your your mechanic shop. They're they're little uh, prayer pamphlets and whatnot. If you ever take the time to read them, you know they are exactly that. Porn and propaganda. When I say porn, I'm meaning by the definition of the word porn, which means uh, something that is uh, to to attract. You know, something like a commercial can be considered porn. It's not pornography; it's porn. And uh, propaganda is just that something that's going to uh, repel you from a certain thing. And that's what these uh, uh, articles are. These these uh, pamphlets are just that: porn and propaganda. Right between the sheets. Okay, so this is where I start blending in romance novels into this um, uh, uh, using um, uh, porn. I mean, some of these these are uh, once people figured out that my imagery and my work was about sexuality, I started getting people donating magazines to me donating there was an individual who had passed away that when the uh family went into his studio they had found um magazines that led them to believe that he may have had homosexual tendencies but all his life never had an opportunity to express that you know um and and i thought that that was kind of sad you know that 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 this individual all his life lived a life that was dutiful and and to his family but in in the back of his mind was was probably repressed in some way, shape, or form. Um, the whole love series uses a, 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 um, a, 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 I use a technique, or how would you say it? Like a, I have these uh, uh, habits that I try and incorporate, these rituals. And one of them, if you look back, I'm painting the figures all with white, all right, in, in an attempt to whitewash flesh. You know, um, because the human flesh is uh, is a uh, a proof of one conjugal act. So everybody here is pu proof that that there was a conjugal act that happened, and therefore, according to religion or according to Catholicism, that's sinful. So I'm beginning to white out or or cover up the flesh as as a way of whitewashing and purifying it. Right. Carnal love, one, two, and three, and that's this one here. All right, so now we're moving on. This is a completely, you can tell that the aesthetics have changed. Um, I'm still dealing with the idea of sexuality. Um, I, I started collecting a lot of uh, romance novels and reading through these romance novels. And, you know, if people get offended by pornography, why are you not offended by the text that's in these romance novels? Woo! You know, my, my wife loves them. <laughs> so... Um, I started collecting these things and, and using them as an idea, as an idea of, of in, in this series, this is from here to there. I'm really working with the idea or, or of uh, a memes that are, or meta archetypes of masculine and feminine masculinity and femininity. Um, I'm thinking of these in, in terms of like memes and not memes that we see in Facebook, but memes like the original, um, uh, the original person who coined the word, Richard Dawkins, used a meme as an idea or a thought that is infectious. So um, religious religion are memes, all right? Um, row, row, row your boat. The song itself is a meme. It, it Like an earworm, it enters our brain and it kind of sticks. Um, well, um, stereotypes of masculinity and femininity are also memes that keep bubbling up in society. So I started creating these little bubbles, these little universes, right? Um, the way I see it is that these are the memes and these stereotypes are effervescing throughout society. And they are the things that are controlling how we select our partners, you know, like, like how we're choosing our partners. Whether you know. So it's impacting kind of our visual literacy with it. Um, and, you know, I, I see a theme that has, or motif more so, that's kind of uh, throughout your work, and it's this pointillism. Like, why, why, why do you keep 
uh, I know you're probably about to go into it, particularly for this one, but huh. why constantly being drawn back to creating a series of dots? Dots. dots. Yeah. Uh, for the most recent body of work, like the piece you see sitting behind me, it's um, the easiest way to get to color. All right. It's uh, it, it's it doesn't rely on mark or line. All right. The dot is in of itself just a little drop of color and it interacts with other dots next to it. In this piece here, all right, when, uh, or these pieces here, I'm interested in how the density of dots and marks create uh, patterns and, and can um, inform or um, guide composition, you know. Um, and then at the same time, they act as those bubbles, you know, so I can crop out uh, uh, figures and um, cut and create like little uh, peepholes where you're looking through into a little world. You know, um, so that's why they're they're kind of like universal. They feel like space or or uh, the uh, universe is something that I'm trying to trying to get at. And I want to I want to note that you've kind of switched to wallpaper here instead of either painting or. Yes, these are so all wallpaper installations. Yes. And, yeah. and so why why did you decide to go to that um, scale? Um, I'm limited in. I don't like painting on canvas. Uh, uh, every you know, painters always say that the what's that term? The romance or the bounce of the canvas. You know, when their brush hits it, it drives me crazy. You know, seeing that canvas bounce back and forth. So when I work on panels, I'm limited in scale. I kind of you know, a four by eight foot sheet is probably as far as I can go, unless I want to construct and sand and do all this stuff. And then they're really heavy and bulky. You, you know, so so there is a limitation. With this wallpaper, there's no limitation. I can make this as big as I want, as long as the gallery is willing to fund the project. I can, I can print endless uh, rolls of this stuff. Uh, it's a fun fabric to work with. It's a stuff called Phototex. Um, it's a, uh, uh, it's water. You can print it with inkjet inks. All right, it is repositionable. All right, and and um, pretty permanent. So it's permanent in the sense that once it's on the wall, it sticks and it's not going to move. But if you decide to move it, you can peel it off and re-stick it back on hundreds of times. It's like, what do you ever have you ever seen that stuff on fat heads on uh, for uh, um, sports posters and stuff like that? It's a oh, yeah, thing. yeah. So it's the same material that they're using there. So it's a really easy and. Um, uh, easy material to use and create uh, to work with. So it, the installation of it's simple. It's not like I have to use wheat paste or anything like that. For do you it. have to? Do you mm -hmm. have? Do you save them for and then um, reuse them? At different no, galleries? no, no. Because because they're they're site specific. If I were to use them someplace else, they probably wouldn't fit the space. So for this series, for these, these this is from here to there. All of these are still the same title from here to there. There, the um, reason, um, well, the way I do this is I've collected all of these images. I've scanned them in from 1930s to 1950s, men's health magazines to pinup magazines. Then once I've collected those images as the base archetypes of masculine and feminine imagery, then I went into Google and I Googled things like a uh, nice smile. And in Google Images, I collected all of the images of these nice smiles that Google considers. Then I would, you know, type in nice abs, nice hair, you know, all of the characteristics that you would think of for, you know, oh, my, you know, I, I met this new girl. She's really cute, that kind of stuff, you know, and, and, and put that in and then collect those. So if you look at it, there's these 19, these older nostalgic um, imagery of, of men and women, and then superimposed in there or spotted around it are more contemporary images that um, Google has decided are, are, you know, nice eyes, nice, nice butt, nice feet, nice figure, that kind of stuff. So, and, and it's all put in this universe kind of thing. Derek, do you mind if uh, we ask you a question from the chat? Not, not at all. Um, Danielle wants to know if you got any commentary or feedback from the priests at the artist talk in Dayton. Oh yeah, I did. Oh yeah. It was, <laughs> they were, um, it was a really, they, okay. During the talk, they didn't say anything. Right. So my talk ended, it was radio silence. A couple of students asked a couple of questions. I'm frozen. Am I okay? All right. Am I hanging back now? Yeah. I'm back now. All right. 
uh, uh, the students, students were asking all the questions. The priest said nothing. The following day, I was not able to stay for all of the events they had planned around my work. Um, but the following day after the talk, they had a panel discussion with four people. You can Google this. You can go in and Google University of Dayton, my name. It'll pull up a video, a, a YouTube video of that talk of them discussing the work. And it's kind of funny when you listen to it because they start trashing it immediately, basically saying that I'm using old tropes. Oh, uh, what is it? L Lichtenstein used Vende dots way before, and he's just ripping Lichtenstein off. There was, you know, all kinds of stuff. And then the students started defending me. I was like, yes, thank you. The students were like, that's not exactly what he said. You're taking his words out of context. You know, you guys aren't, you know, and it was really interesting to see that the, the fact that the students were paying more attention to than, than the, these, these four panelists, because there was an art historian, there was a priest who, who was, uh, his specialty was uh, copyright law. All right. Uh, there was an art story. There was an artist. There was a photographer there. And I forgot who the other person was. Oh, a woman whose specialty was pornography and uh, 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 women's uh, women's rights. So she had a lot of interesting things to say, basically said that I was a misogynist, you know. So it, it was Google it. It's funny. It's, it's worth it's, it's about an hour, you know, it, it, and it's kind of funny to, to, to listen to them talk about that. So. Here, let me move on. So this is the most recent work from this series. So this was done in 2019. So again, the other work was back from 2010, maybe. It effervesced up. I found another reason, you know, to make more work like this, you know. So uh, it, it, came, it came back and I, I had the, the uh, work. So I, I went ahead and put this piece together. And this one all around the rainbow, just like it said. And you can read in here, like, you know, what is normal sex life? You can go through all these things. It's about, like, how are we comparing ourselves to, and what is normal? You know, to me, normal is a setting on a washing machine. And when it comes to sexuality, it means nothing, right? All right. So now, Going on, so coming back, once again, my aesthetics effervesce back up. So I was invited by Space 111 to participate in a gun exhibition, all right, that uh, was dealing with gun violence. Uh, so once I got the invitation, I felt it was necessary for do, to do my research and to begin to uh, figure out what it is about gun violence. So I started reading books. I started, you know, reading articles, start looking at, um, uh, d different, um, research, uh, uh, documents about, about what it is about gun violence. And I started pulling out some really interesting data from it. All right. So excuse me, I'm going to start reading here. So, uh, two of the five, two of five self identified, uh, self identified white evangelicals, uh, two out of five self identified white evangelicals own a gun. Higher than any other religious group, according to recent study from Pew, Pew, Pew Research. All right, Americans who attend religious services weekly were, weekly were less likely to own a gun, rather than uh, than those who attended less frequently. All right, um, an American with a high level of religious commitments were less likely to own a gun than those who commitments were low. Right at the same time, high reli highly religious gun owners are twice as likely to belong to the NRA as less religious gun owners. Gun owners who worship weekly are more likely to join the NRA than those who do not worship uh, uh, in, worship as often. All right, and, and there, there's like statistics to go to this. This was a really interesting article that I found. I was wondering why? Why is religion? Why, why does, especially evangelicals, are, why are they so interested in, in, in owning a weapon? So then I began reading even further. After reading this, uh, the, the statistics, the first thing that came to mind was why is religiosity, uh, specifically evangelical Christianity, linked to gun ownership when gun violence is the antithesis of what is preached in the New Testament? The answer it is rooted in the American nostalgia, in, in nostalgia and has been uh, ingrained in American culture for years, as stated by Lily Higgins in her article on gun advertising. 
According to gun advertisements spanning the past century, guns have the power to make a boy a man, a house into a home, and a recent immigrant into a real American. The breeding, the, the, the branding of the gun guns in America was further driven home by uh, Davy Crockett's fever, uh, uh, fever, Davy Crockett fever sweeping the nation. The icons of the uh, frontiersman holding the musket and a powder horn was ingrained in the American boy's mind as the founding values of our nation. Because of this branding, America, along with its push to create a Christian nation, all right. Most Americans believe guns are an American institution, a, necess a necessary safety precaution, a tool, even a God-given right, despite myriads of facts and statistics that show that owning a gun only puts you and your family more at risk. All right. So I created this image. If you can see it, it's Jesus made out of thousands and thousands and thousands of little guns. So the way it was created, I did this in Illustrator, took an image of Jesus, put it in Illustrator as a background. I had all of these guns that I had found on the internet, these uh, um, a, uh, uh, vector-based gun files. So uh, every gun you can imagine, there was a silhouette of it. I found it and was able to purchase stock images of it. Then I began just using all these guns to create um, the image of, uh, that you see here. So you get a close-up there of all the pistols and all the, the guns and it's layered. So there's probably eight layers going up. So there's a layer of resin, then there's guns pasted down. Then there's another layer of resin, then more guns are laid on top of it. And so when you actually see the piece, there's probably about a half inch of resin with guns layered all throughout it. So it has a real three dimensional feel to it. It, it, it also has um, this, you know, little lapel pin, which to me, uh, kind of irks me that all politicians feel the need to put on this little uh, lapel pin so that they can prove to us that they're patriotic, yet they sit there and do anything, uh, uh, anything but create good circumstances for the American people, All right. So this one here is Guns, Gods, and the State of the Union. So it's the American flag, the same thing. The way I got the American flag to show through is just from different layers of guns. So there's more guns layered on the white stripes than there are on the red, uh, on the, um, uh, the red stripes, you know, and so forth. So, and also these, this series of work is covered in glitter. So I mix the resin and I pour tons of glitter in it because I want it to be sparkly and magical, you know, because, you know, Jesus is magical. So these need to be magical. All right. This is America. All right. This explores the relationship of gun ownership, religious, religiosity, and porn consumption. Because in this same research about gun ownership, I also found out that the Bible Belt here, where we live, consumes more porn than anywhere in the world, right? And why? This is the Bible Belt, really? Right? Thoughts and prayers, all right? Let me, let me get to my notes here, sorry. All right. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so thoughts and prayers. I, I like this. This is my, I like how I, uh, the, the medium down here, magic fairy dust on panel. All right. All right. With, with this work, I wanted to challenge the idea that gun ownership is a God given right. I hope people see that the religious fervor surrounding the cult of the gun is only holding the United States hostage. I want people to question when a, when a, a politician says we want more prayer in schools in order to quell gun, uh, gun violence. I also want to challenge the notion that prayer is a way to solve anything in terms of gun violence. Two hands working will always do more than a thousand hands praying. All right, so now we're moving away from this stuff, and I'm getting into, my, um, uh, this is all my blinded series. This is the pointless stuff, the really obsessive pointless stuff. And, and Derek, as you kind of go into this one, you've talked a lot about kind of research and everything, which goes into a lot of contemporary art. Um, and to bring me around from that, you also have to teach students that. So what... Uh, just uh, because I know we are starting to get a little low on time. Um, okay. Why? Why did you get into to teaching? Um, yeah. Why? Why, why did? did I, yeah. Why did I get into teaching? All right. Let's see. Um, well, honestly, because of the paycheck. 
I mean, I'll be, I'll be frank. You know what I mean? Like if, if I were selling my artwork and I didn't have to sit and teach students, I'd be in here. I'd just be in my studio painting. Not that I don't enjoy working with students, but I'm an artist first and I'm, I'm, I'm a professor second. And I think it's important for me to keep that in, in that, that hierarchy there, you know, mm -hmm. because I can't be a good professor to my students unless I'm also engaged in my artistic practice. So, you know, that, that's, you know, so. That's how is I got it. Is it because I know this particular body of work has a lot of um, theory and then color theory and everything that kind of goes into it. Uh, do, is it fair to say that your teaching does sometimes then impact your artwork and kind of how you think about oh, your yeah, artwork? There is a dialogue that goes back and forth. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. This is, um, um, I did get into this body because of me teaching color theory, you know, mm -hmm. and, and get be, really being becoming interested in color in and of itself. In printmaking, color is really hard to access. Uh, it, it, it's not that you can't print color like in, in silk screen and, and, and whatnot, but it's still a process that you have to go through. And it's not as um, intuitive. It's not as uh, 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 instant. It's not a process of instant gratification, right? Printmaking is not. You have to slowly build up a print and work it to a point. Whereas when I'm doing these pointillist paintings, it's instant. I, I take a drop of paint, I put it on there, I can see exactly what happened, you know, and then I can continue working where it's in printmaking. It's not that way. Maybe someday I'll figure out a way of translating this, this body of work into print, but it, it's, it's not. So yes, um, my, uh, my, my teaching does inform this body of work for sure. You know, so um, let me see. I'm sorry, I threw you off your your, yeah, your yeah, explanation you know, that you were about to do. <laughs> that's all right. Um, that's all right. Yeah, this 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 work is just blinded. It's called blinded the light, the truth. Um, I'm interested in moments where light blinds you, right, and you're held in aesthetic arrest, and that aesthetic arrest can be deceiving because there that the blinding light can sometimes hide danger bombs blowing up muzzle fire um the, it was inspired this whole series was inspired by by um reading albers joseph albers um and his uh, uh the way he talks about how color can fill the eye and that that we don't see color independent of other colors so but that that there is opportunity to do that and if when you go to the eye doctor you know when they test the pressure of your eye in the eye doctor they put that little blue rubber thing right on your cornea and at that point your whole vision fills with this intense blue light um i find that stimulating exhilarating right that kind of stuff it's almost like it's almost like taking a drug you know it's it really like hits the optic nerve and goes right into the brain um the same thing has happened to me when i'm driving I've had a fog on my window and I'd go to turn and the sun's hitting that window just right so that I can't see anything out of it. But yet I'm pulling out in the traffic and you have that that moment where you're that that unknown fear, you know, but you're still held in aesthetic arrest. At least I am because the light was so gorgeous coming through the window. It's a weird I, I have to admit that this body of work, I have a hard time explaining. It's more about a passion that I have than a, that's something that's like logical in my head. All right. Just before the eclipse, I'm interested in astronomy. You could see that in my previous work. Um, uh, uh, I'm interested in particle physics. Yeah. So I, I, I watch a lot of Nova. I read a lot of scientific articles and journals. Um, Dawn. Focus, the idea of how um, technology is getting better. Therefore, we're able to see different things like what uh, 20 years ago, we didn't have proof of exoplanets and now we do. And part of that is because we were able to focus a little better our, our, our technology. So uh, this is a diptych that's kind of like that. The one on the right is the blurred image and then the one on the left is the focused image. This is the piece you see behind me here, flash. And then finally, high beams, you know, you've been in that situation in fog where some morons got his high beams on driving on the other side of the road and you can't see. Derek, I also want to kind of draw a parallel that I've seen with your wallpaper artwork and then and then this. They both kind of give you this 
uh, um, notion of the cosmos. So like you're a little bit more direct in the wallpaper, but this, even though this is high beams, it's still, it exists somewhere within the, the cosmos and, and it's in, in light in of itself, it kind of makes up our idea of cosmos. Right. Is, does that play like consciously within um, this particular? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Some of, some of the works are just that, like me trying to, let me go back here real quick. Like, you know, th th this piece here, I mean, it's the, the, the curve of the earth and the sun kind of rising over the other side, you know, that certain burst of light that comes um, just before the eclipse. Uh, if you watch an eclipse happen, there's weird little spectacles of light that burst off of it as the sun kind of begins to move behind the, um, the moon, you know? So, so yeah, they're definitely drawn from, from those, from that. So uh, I, I can't have a question for you, Derek. Yeah. Jump in. Um, Amanda wants to know how long it takes for you to complete one of these pieces. Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. This piece was started um, uh, probably about a month before COVID hit, right? And so it's just finishing right now. Like, and it's still hanging on my wall. I posted it on Facebook saying it was finished, but I can't hold myself to that because it'll sit on the wall for probably another month or two and I'll pull it down and I'll do something else to it until I have an exhibition or it goes on some collector's wall. It may not be finished. You know, it, it, sometimes they, they take a lot longer. Here's a detail so you can see. So yeah. with that, can you, can you tell us a little bit how you make, make these? Sure. Um, I'm using uh, different viscosity mediums. So I have like, uh, say, uh, a regular fluid matte medium. And then I have that super gel medium from um, Golden Acrylics. And I blend that together to give me different viscosity droplets or paints. So I can mix it and I drip the paint on the canvas. You can see my little pot here with the, uh, the paint in it. I consider, I paint like a printmaker. I'm not a painter, right? I, I have one color and I sit there all day using that one color, dripping, 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 let it dry. Then I'll pull out another color. Just like in printmaking, you would roll up a plate with one color, print it, get another plate, one color, print it. So that's basically how I'm working because that's how my brain works, you know. Um, mm -hmm. after, but I'm dripping these in order to try and get as perfect a dot as possible. I'm letting the the uh, surface tension and the viscosity of the medium control the dot. And I change the viscosity of the medium depending on how thick or thin I want those dots. So some of the dots, the first layer of dots is really thin. So I use a really thinned out medium. And, they, and it dries almost flat and, and flush to the surface of the panel. Then as I'm layering more dots on it, I start thickening up the medium. So I start getting some dimension and some depth to the, to the, to the drip. So is it primarily freehand or do you have a... Like, it's freehand. It's a, it's a paintbrush and, and a little pot of paint and me sitting there dripping, dripping paint. That's absolutely amazing. I, I think I speak for probably a lot of us on the call that the, the patience I'm sure that that goes into that is um, it is incredible because um, it, it's just it all, it's, and then working with only just one color at a time. That's incredible. Well, thanks. Thanks. It's um, it's more like a meditation. You know, um, I started like my, actually my work. Remember when I said, you said, what, how did I get started doing art? I was doing pointless drawings in my notebooks at school. All right. So just to give you an idea, I'm just a uh, 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 history. I'm dyslexic. All right. And I'm not dyslexic in that flip way that people say, oh, I flip my B's and D's. No, I have a hard time. Spelling, I have a hard time reading. It's not just, you know, it's a serious thing. Um, so when I was in school, that was my escape. I was in class, in English class, because I knew I was going to go to summer school. So what the fuck? I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to pay attention the whole time. I'm going to have to redo this in summer school. So I would sit and draw and paint, you know, or just sit there with my uh, a, a Sharpie marker, little fine tip Sharpie marker, and do these little pointless drawings in there. And that's what the students really got turned on to. So this is really going all the way back to me in high school, you know, and pulling back some of that obsessive kind of drawing uh, uh, cap the capabilities that I had and applying it with paint now and using pointillist and color theory to bring out what these ideas are. And so, uh, Derek, we're almost at the end of time. 
is sure. this the is this the series that you've been primarily working on in COVID, or did you have a another series that you started because of COVID? This is this is, this is the series that I'm working on in COVID. I'm just like uh, in this studio because this is my home studio. I'm working on these kind of stuff. I I don't have an, a lot of um, room in here, so I I. Mm-hmm. I'm working on smaller uh, Yupo paper kind of drawings and paintings, you know, where these are the studies that then lead to the bigger works that, that kind of um, end up. And this is what I've been doing. You see them here. Oh yeah. It's, it, can, you, can you get it? Yes. All right. So um, it's hard to work here. I have a six year old and he likes to collaborate so I, I can't do anything too serious in here. So I try and kind of keep the big stuff back at the school studio. And I just keep um, stuff that I'm not worried if he decides to come in here and, and you know, add to my composition, you know, which, which <laughs> well, he has. I'm sure, I'm sure he'll go into art in some capacity uh, when, he, when he gets older, or at least enjoy it as kind of a side thing. Um, so we are, we're pretty much at the end of time Oh, this yeah. has been incredibly informative, Derek. Did you want to say uh, one or two last things about this body of work? No, no, I think that's it. If anyone has any questions or anything like that, just let me know. This is this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Derek. I have yeah. I, I have always thoroughly enjoyed it, particularly this this series because you you had a piece of this up in the um, in the uh, faculty show uh, a couple of years ago as well. And so um, it's always, it's always great to see kind of how different your art uh, has been and, and you keep coming back to different kind of themes. So uh, thank you so, so much. Um, uh, if you don't mind uh, stopping screen share, we're going to switch to uh, grid view. And if you guys have been working on anything during this, we would love for you to turn on your cameras and show us, uh, yeah. what, what you've been working on. And I hate to say, I did not get very far <laughs> oh, <I know. laughs> well on mine, but this has been absolutely, this amazing. Uh, Amanda. Someone, who's doing it on the computer? Who's that? Amanda? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I absolutely Cheater. cheated. I, yeah. I did. I absolutely cheated. And I worked on this uh, for the past few days. <laughs> Funny. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> okay, well, thank you guys. And if you weren't able to turn on your cameras and you did work on something, we would love to see it. Uh, please post it to Instagram and tag us at Ava UAB. And then Derek, um, I forgot to write down your Instagram handle, but I know it's Derek Krakow. Is that is it yeah, just that? Okay. All right. Yep, yeah, at, yeah. at Derek Krakow. Nothing, nothing crazy, you know. <laughs> Wonderful. So please tag us in it. And um, don't forget, we are going to have the April 1st uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts graduating students presenting on their work. And uh, they have each created coloring sheets for us. So those will be up online for the registration link here soon. Um, and yes, Amanda has put uh, Derek's webpage in the chat. So uh, be sure to check that out if you're interested about learning more. Uh, but thank you so much, Derek. Uh, it's been a great honor having you here. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon on campus. We're yes, all back. No, no, no kidding. Face to face. Yes, absolutely. Well, All right. Thank you, for, everyone. Yep. Thank you, guys. Bye.